Okay, uh, I think this is, is this on? Okay. Hi, hi, grade eight. So this is our second lecture. My color is a little constricting, hold on. So this is our second lecture in our, for our, from our book. And we are going to talk about, for, for the subject of colonialism and imperialism, this is going to be the last, the last section that we are going to discuss because after this, the last two topics that we have, if we have time, uh, God willing, will be colonialism, uh, sorry, nationalism. Nah. So after all the colonialization and the imperialism and everything, um, Asia started to feel like it was not right for the West to keep doing that to them and that it was time that they love their own nation, love their own country so that they can build their own nation as a sovereign and autonomous people. Okay, so we are going to talk about the colonialism and imperialism in Southeast Asia, which includes the Philippines, okay? So we are going to start with what they called Southeast Asia before. What was the name? What were the names of Southeast Asia? according to the West. So I don't know why this isn't moving. Okay, so here. Other names of Southeast Asia, particularly at those times. The first name is Greater India. So we were not automatically called Southeast Asia. We were called Greater India for a time uh, because of connections to the Indian civilization. As you know, we are very close to India. So the West sort of just assumed that we were all part of the Indian um, Indian civilization or whatever. And the next is Little China because we are close, very, very close to China. And we, we were in fact, Southeast Asia was in fact trading with China a lot. So that is why these were our names, okay? We were called the Little China. We were called Little China. I'm looking for my, my laser pointer. So we were called Greater India and little China. Now, when or how did the West arrive in these parts? Okay, so as you know, the Spice Islands, this is not something that I need to repeat. I think a lot of emphasis has been placed on this before. So this is not something that I have to keep repeating. Uh, the spices were the ones that, spices were the ones that attracted a lot of the West to Southeast Asia because the Spice Islands are here. So the collective term of a lot of the areas of, of Southeast Asia are actually the Spice Islands, okay? So this is water. It's in a wine bottle, but it's water, okay? Don't, okay, anyway. So the arrival of the Westerners in the region was mainly because of the Spice Islands. You know how much everybody was obsessed with spice. Um, and spices grew very, very beautifully in our parts, okay? So this is not, this is not um, new to you. So I will not put so much emphasis on it because this has been repeated countless of times before. So let us go to individual Western nations that arrived in Southeast Asia. And we will start with the Portuguese. Okay, I'm going to fix mine. Okay, there. So the Portuguese in Southeast Asia, what did they do here? Okay, now, the Portuguese, they were the first ones. You remember the story of Prince Henry the Navigator. He was the, he was the one who had a school in Portugal. I, I remember we had this lecture. Uh, so he was the, actually the one who started that. And when they discovered the coastal parts of Africa, and then they discovered that there was... Um, an eastern portion of Africa, and then they arrived in India. Eventually, they reached Southeast Asia. And when they reached Southeast Asia, they did not, they did not sort of change their strategy. They were still always interested in um, port areas. They did not really go and set up colonies. They really, they really did not build colonies or fortify or whatever. They were just interested in setting up trading posts 
and trading with Africa and one, uh, not Africa, sorry, Southeast Asia. And one of their most important discoveries, I think, where they really settled and actually they made a lot of money was Malacca. Now, when I saw this picture, it made me very interested to go to this portion of Malacca. It just looks very... It looks very beautiful to me. It's very attractive and it's kind of, it's, it's a very laid back place. So God willing, maybe if this ECQ lockdown, whatever COVID virus will disappear, it would be very nice to visit Malacca. I just found it very interesting. Okay, so uh, the first areas that the Portuguese actually discovered was Malacca and Malacca or Moluccas is actually what is known as the Spice Islands, okay? Now, the spices that grew in Malacca were very varied. They were very extensive and cheap, very, very cheap because the supply was so high. So the demand was so high for the spices and when they reached Malacca, they saw that the supplies were very high. So the Portuguese earned a lot of money here and they made Ternate, which was actually a better port area. If Malacca was a good source of the spices, Ternate was a better port. So Ternate became a, uh, the trading center between the Southeast Asians of the Spice Islands and the Portuguese. And, you know, if you read... If you read documents by the Spaniards who lived in the Philippines during the 1500s, Ternate actually comes up a lot as a, as a place where the Spaniards also traded because they also wanted to buy spices. This name comes up a lot, okay? Now, Lifau was actually also one of the places because can you imagine, I know you are aware of the Asian map, right? And the if Southeast Asia is here and the Philippines is here, you know that Indonesia is at the bottom and at the tip is Timor-Leste. They reach Timor-Leste and this is the place in Timor-Leste where they arrived and the place is called Lifau. So um, this is the only place that the Portuguese ever colonized. You know, they never really colonized any other place except Lifau in Timor, which is strange to me because it is so far from all the trading centers ever but anyway this that's the only place that they that they colonize which could be quite interesting uh, to write a paper on if if ever sayang boya you don't have term paper i know a lot of you are relieved and don't worry i'm not getting any funny ideas of bringing it back for this school year but um, it's sayang that under your belt you will God willing, only have three term papers when you graduate CLF uh, rather than the usual four. Okay, so now, when the Portuguese, uh, when the Portuguese, what do you call this? Um, no empire again lasts forever. I keep repeating that. I hope um, you're not sick of that statement. But just like any other empire, the Portuguese started to dwindle. They started to lose a lot of wars. They started to lose a lot of money. Uh, they started to forfeit a lot of territory. And most of their territories went to the Dutch and the British. So when the Portuguese, they began everything. And when they started to falter, they lost all their territories to the Dutch and, the, and Great Britain. Actually, ang Dutch good grabe because they literally just took over. Morag kind of like the Portuguese laid down the hard work and then the Dutch and the British just kind of took over. Okay, okay, sorry. I have to leave now. Looy kaayo sila. So now let's go to the Dutch in Southeast Asia. What were the Dutch doing here. Now, just a quick side note. You know, the Dutch really wanted to take the Philippines as well. They, uh, they set their eyes on the Philippines, but thankfully they did not get the Philippines. Can you imagine if they did? Uh, if they took the Philippines, we would have a very, very different, um, we, they, we would have a very different history. Okay, so um, God did not allow the Dutch to take the Philippines. So, but anyway, just a quick, side note that they wanted to take us. Now, they set up, okay, 
this is a very unique way of imperialism. This is very similar. Uh, we, we will start with the Dutch. That is the Ver, uh, Verenigde Oost Indisch Company. Not even going to try to memorize that, but that is in English the Dutch, the Dutch East India Company or the Dutch East Indies Company, and that is their logo. Now, this is very interesting. This is not a government unit. Unlike the Portuguese and even the Spanish, where they were exploring under the flag of the, the monarchy, they did not fly. Sorry, they did not, not fly. They did not imperialize under the name of the monarchy. They had the approval of the monarchy and they even had the protection of the monarchy, but they did not directly report to the monarchy. The, the Dutch East India Company was a business, okay? Mga, negoci mga negosyante. They were businessmen. They were, they invested in this and they were the ones who kind of flew the Dutch flag and conquered all these places. So it's, this is the first time we hear that a business company is the one is the one making the decisions making the explorations so this is a very unique situation okay so when we say governor general john peterson cohen he he's the director of the voc i'm just going to say voc for dutch east india company he was the he was the Mm, the what do you call this the director of the voc and he was not like kind of he was not part of the government like he was not a noble or anything but he was assigned governor general it's a very unique situation indeed it's the first time that it has happened now he established a batavia as the capital of the Dutch in Southeast Asia. Now, Batavia is no longer called Batavia today, but it is known as Jakarta, something that you are very familiar with because it is the capital of Indonesia. So, Batavia was the one that was established as the center of the Dutch presence in Southeast Asia. It was the base for the Dutch spice monopoly, and it became a very important trading center in Southeast Asia. So, so no more Portuguese now. Goodbye, Portuguese. Now we are going, the Dutch are going to take over. Now, when they made Batavia, they patterned it after the European model. When they designed the city or the, I, I don't know if they called it a city before, uh, of Batavia, they made it as European as possible. So this is actually another Aside from Malacca, this would be a very interesting place to, to visit, okay? Because it, you can see the marriage between Southeast Asia and Europe so much. Now, the Dutch did not stop at the occupation of Batavia, but they also took Java. Um, not because of its, its trading kind of its port advantage, but because the natural resources of Java was very good. And Java, aside from spices, had a particular product that they really wanted. And that product is the wood called teak. Okay. There was so much teak in Java and teak is very essential in construction, not just of homes or buildings, but in the ships that were used. Teak was the, the favored um, lumber of choice when they would build or repair their, their ships and daghan kaayuni in, in Java. So that is why they took Java. And of course, by default, they took Malacca also. See, it's so pretty. I mean, it's pink. I would really want to visit here. Like it looks a, like a very interesting place. Yeah, it would be fun there and very, very interesting. So that was the Dutch. Now let's go to the British in Southeast Asia. You already know some of the deeds that the British did, particularly in China with the Opium War. 
they're they're not really they don't play fair it's really not like they they're kind of an oppressive people what they were imperialists in asia now just as the dutch started the british uh, the uh, Dutch East India Company, they started the British East India Company. Same principle, it was businessmen and and all that. Am I going to, okay, okay, sorry, I thought I wasn't, I'm just going to move this here, it's a little uncomfortable. Okay, so they started the British East India Company, which is the same principle as the Dutch East India Company. Okay, now, they took Penang Island, now, where is Penang? Vietnam, okay? Penang is in Vietnam and um, the British extended its power from here, from Penang Island, all the way to a large part of Malaysia. So as you can see, um, Malacca is in Malaysia. Um, the Dutch and the British were kind of moving closer to each other. Like it was, it was really... But so they were really moving closer to each other, which is never good when two nations kind of bump into each other because it usually ends up in a war. So they were already extending their influence in Malacca. And it was around this time also that the many of the people who were under the British East India Company were complaining because they did not really like how the British were handling, how the British East India Company was handling relationships with the colonists. They did not like how they did things because a lot were very oppressive and abusive. So they kept, there were a lot of protests. So the government took the control of the colonies from the British East India Company and gave it to the monarch. So this did not happen with the Dutch East India Company, but it happened with the British East India Company. So now the British East India Company had to hand over all control of the colonies to Queen Victoria. Okay, so Queen Victoria was the monarch of Britain at this time, and she was the one who, who took all the colonies from the British East India company okay so now like queen victoria was the empress of the world oh kina's gonna get mad because she's not the only empress okay now sir thomas stamford raffles uh, began singapore so he is actually the founder of singapore this is one of the things that the british did and you know that singapore for those of you who have been to singapore singapore is a Singapore is a, a small island. It's a small archipelago, not island. It's a small archipelago. The weather is not very favorable there. So it's not like they took Singapore because it had lots of natural resources. In fact, it is very hot in Singapore. There is no uh, clear, like running water. There are no really good rivers in Singapore. I don't even know. Let me see this. I don't think there's even a river in Singapore. So it's not very good in terms of natural resources, but the location of Singapore is very strategic. And uh, Sir Stamford, Thomas Stamford Raffles saw the potential of Singapore and said, okay, okay, this could be good. And he took Singapore, um, he took Singapore and just as predicted, Singapore experienced very rapid development. It became a base of operations for the British and it just became very fast in terms of becoming the center of trade in Southeast Asia. And even until now, you know that Singapore is very fast in terms of trade and development because it's not natural resources there. Their wealth is in being strategically located and being a center of business. So, so many Chinese and foreign traders were very attracted to, they were very attracted to Singapore and a lot, a lot of people flocked to Singapore in order to do business with the British there. Now, so the British were expanding. They were in Malaysia. The Dutch were in Indonesia. They were so close to each other already. So they were like, Unsaman magwarta? Do you want a war? Nobody wants a war. 
war is something you want to avoid. So the Dutch and the British were like, no, I don't think we should have a war. Let's just sign a treaty. So this is actually one of those treaties that did not need a war. Okay, the Anglo-Dutch Treaty of 1824, wherein the Malay Peninsula was divided into a British and a Dutch zone. You remember when the world was divided by the Pope? in the treaties of uh, the Treaty of Tordesillas and the Treaty of Zaragoza between the Spain and the Portuguese. The Anglo-Dutch Treaty of um, 1824 was kind of like this. They divided the Malay Peninsula and said, okay, this part's yours, this part's mine. Let's agree, let's not start a war. We cannot fight over this. It's just not worth it. Okay, now, and then another settlement was brought in in the Strait Settlement of 1824 where the Dutch surprisingly gave all her territory in Malaysia to the British. Maybe the Dutch wanted to focus on Indonesia but they were like okay here just take take it all. So they were like just take everything away from us. Now James Brooke, who was British, he did something quite, um, <laughs> I want to say legendary. I think it's because he reminds me of Barney from How I Met My Mother, How I Met Your Mother Day, How I Met Your Mother. Kind of has a Barney vibe. So anyway, he did, and he really did. James Brooke really did something legendary. And then, so he gathered the tributaries in Siam and he was able to conquer Brunei, okay? Brunei, you know, that Brunei is still in the Malay Peninsula. He became the white Raja, okay? So he became the first, he became a Raja. He actually became kind of like a Raja or a Sultan in Brunei and he was white. So there's actually a novel written about him. It's called The White Raja because he ruled Brunei. So he was British. It's, you know what's interesting about him is he grew up, he was born while his parents were sailing because they were part of the British East India Company. So he grew up in the British East India Company, sort of, um, he, so he knew the trade. So anyway, he became, it, it's, he was, he's responsible. If Raffles did Singapore, it was James Brooke that did uh, Brunei and he actually really ruled Brunei. Now, what about Burma? Okay, what about Burma? Now, Burma was very strategic. The British wanted to get Burma because Burma was kind of like the bridge from Southeast Asia to India. So they were like, we really need Burma. So it was in this, it was in this portion that, but the Burmese did not want, the Burmese did not want the British to control them. Because there, there's even this place in Burma that's very sacred to the Burmese people. They call it Adam's Peak. Um, it, it, it was said to have been a peak that nobody has ever laid foot on ever since the creation of the world. So it's the most unexploited part in Burma. So that is how much they hold their territory very kind of sacredly. And then now the, the British all of a sudden want to take it. So they did not, they really resisted. So this led to the first, first, huh? first, so meaning there's going to be others. Okay, so the first Anglo, which is Britain, the first Anglo-Burmese war. So look at, look at this picture. Oh. Look at all the modern weapons that the British have. And then they were against really the natives of Burma, but they really, really resisted. So this is, uh, this is considered in British history as the longest and most costly war in British India history. So it was long, it was really tiring, but of course, obviously the British won. So the British won the first Anglo-Burmese war and this resulted in the Treaty of Yandabo. The Treaty of Yandabo granted Burmese territory to Britain. It's like an echo of what they did in China, no? It's exactly the same thing. They fought a war. And then, as I said before, if there's a first Anglo-Burmese war, then there is a second Anglo-Burmese war. Now, I'm trying to remember why I picked this picture for the second Anglo-Burmese. It doesn't look like a war. 
it looks like a dance off okay so i don't exactly know why i did this but anyway it's too late to change that now then maybe i picked the wrong picture it really looks like a dance off kind of a sassy dance off going on there so in the second anglo-burmese war it was actually fought because this man commodore lambert challenged the burmese in a naval battle it's not all challenges should be accepted and i don't think the burmese should have accepted this challenge because they know how incapable they are but they were like challenge accepted i don't know maybe it was their pride i don't and it was a naval battle and you know that the british had the best navy so of course obviously we're not even going to we're not even going to like it's not spoiler alert if i say that the british won this one again now the third burmese war it's still related to the anglo burmese war but this is different because in the third burmese war the british um fought together with the burmese to stop the french from extending her hands over burma okay so it was kind of to keep the french at bay hold on it was to keep the french at bay so that they will not push towards um indo indo china so this was a whole different story and of course the the british won that so during this time oh it's so pretty this is also another place that i would want to visit mandalay so mandalay was the burmese capital then now i know you know that in burma they keep changing their capital um, they keep they keep changing the names of the capitals, the location of the capital. But during this period in history, the capital of Burma was Mandalay. Okay, when Mandalay was occupied, the Burmese monarchy collapsed. Okay, so there was no more Burmese monarchy. Okay, now let's move to the French. Okay, the French in Southeast. Asia. Now, the French in Southeast Asia were mainly occupying this part. Okay, in the see Mandalay, Myanmar, we have Thailand. They were occupying Indochina. So this would be Indochina, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. So this would be Indochina, where the French were. Okay particularly the lower part of Vietnam, which they named Cochin Chin. Okay, Cochin Chin. I really honestly don't know how to pronounce that because this is French. So maybe there's a whole other pronunciation to that. But um, Cochin Chin sounds like a funny name, but I don't know. So Cochin China or Cochin Chin uh, was particularly where uh, the French word, which is the lower part of Vietnam. Okay, now, also, they extended their territory over Cambodia. Now, we've discussed Cambodia in their ancient times. So now they were, the glory of Cambodia collapsed quite quickly, and now they were under the French, but they were under the protectorate of, of France. Now, the territories of laos were also taken by the french and um the, the laos people i don't know how you call them laotian i don't know uh, the people of laos actually fought the french on this but of course with superior weapons and everything the french won and they also became the protectorate of of france okay so we have that in France. They were in Indochina, mostly concentrated in the lower part of Vietnam, and then Laos and Cambodia were their protectorates. Now, what about the Spanish? The Spanish were in the Philippines, courtesy of Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, who was the man responsible for colonizing the Philippines officially because Magellan was not able to colonize the Philippines. I will not dwell long on this chapter because we've had so many years and so many discussions of Philippine history that you already know the story there, okay, that the Spanish were in the Philippines. And after the Spanish in the Philippines, the Americans were in the Philippines. You remember that? What was the Treaty of Paris? 
how much did they buy the Philippines from Spain in the Treaty of Paris? I'm sure you know this. I hope all of you know this. So in the Treaty of Paris, the Philippines officially, they actually set foot on the Philippines and the Philippines, uh, they were in Southeast Asia already through the Philippines and they had that whole mock battle of Manila Bay and then President William McKinley became our first American governor in the Philippines after they bought us from Spain. And then I will show you kind of the banner that it's kind of like white man's burden. You remember Z's um, report about white man's burden? It's kind of like that, but theirs had a different name. It is called Manifest Destiny. Now, what is Manifest Destiny? It's seriously exactly like white man's burden, wherein they believe that because they were white and superior, they had a duty to help the natives of the world become like like them like they had a right to make the world a better place whether the world likes it or not so lahi po ila no white man's burden that's a creep can you can you believe if you actually found a, a walking lady that big so th that was manifest destiny very very similar to white man's burden so that is how america arrived in southeast asia now thailand was the only country in southeast asia that was never colonized by the west and it is because of their leaders okay so i'll show you what did i okay that is thailand over there again the french were here the dutch were pretty much here um, Spain and then America and then the British were here. Thailand was free. Okay, Thailand maintained its freedom. Why? Because of two particular kings. Number one is King Mongkut. Okay, King Mongkut. He felt he was the monarch of he was the monarch of Thailand when the West when the British were in the West and then the French were in the East and the Dutch were in the South and then there were spheres of influence in the North. So Thailand felt the pressure. They're like, man, kita naman lay na bilin. They might really fight a war or something like that. So they were like, oh no, what are, what are we going to do? So, um, just a side note also you do you are you familiar with the movie king and i it was about siam it was the king of siam who hired a british teacher to tutor his children it's actually based on king Mongkut. there was no love story between him and anna anna leon owens um but she was the tutor of his children during that time so king Mongkut worked so hard to cooperate with the West. So see, he hired a British tutor. He kept trade relations open with the Dutch and the French. So he was very, very friendly. And again, another treaty that did not have a war was the Treaty of Friendship. King Mongkut really secured this for his people. This was a treaty that said nobody will touch Thailand. Now, Thailand was strategically located. Look at that. It's in between everything. The Dutch here, the Spanish and the Americans here, the French here, and the British here. It's kind of like that is the buffer state. It is a state that will remain independent and uh, neutral so that why magilog and it will never be the reason for war. And it will kind of serve as the wall between the West. So very, very smart move for King Mangkat in his establishment of the treaty of friendship and this kind of wisdom uh, one of those rare occasions where the successor has the same ideals and the strength of the parent was when he passed on the throne to his son chulalongkorn okay that's a very long name um chulalongkorn is the son of king Mongkut, and he was actually tutored by anna uh that british tutor and he 
allowed modernization to happen in Thailand. He said, okay, what do you French have to offer? What do you British have to offer? What do the Dutch have to offer? Americans, what do you want? Let's try to make a deal. Under the Treaty of Friendship, we're going to we're going to make everyone happy in this arrangement. So it was a very smart move on the, uh, by the Thai, uh, the Thai monarchy. Okay, so that was a very quick lecture, actually. So that, that, is not, that was not long. So I, we will, I think nationalism is going to be our last topic for this school year. I really would have wanted to be able to finish the school year with you guys, but anyway, that's not how God planned our lives for this year. So we are going to do nationalism. So nationalism is our last topic. I might merge both chapters so that we will have we will have kind of just a nice wrap to this end. Okay, so uh, I will see you for the next lecture and I hope that you understood. Just rewind if you wish to um, review this uh, lecture. Bye guys!